Uh, I assume all of you are familiar with Angel. The guy before me apparently likes to sit with his back to his students. This is an odd class time-wise because it's a four credit hour class, so it actually starts at 10.15. You know, I'll get students that think it started at 10 or 10.30, but it starts at 10.15. And the lecture runs until um, 11.30. The lab, um, I believe, starts immediately after, and it goes until 12.20. Um, you are welcome to stay longer in the lab because I'm probably not going anywhere after class. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to stay longer if, if you want to work on it. Um, the 50-minute lab session really is uh, sometimes too short. It's almost like once you really start to get going, you know, boom, it's time to leave. Well, as long as there isn't a class after us, you're welcome to stay uh, after um, uh, the lab. I like to go over the syllabus, and I'm not going to bore you by reading every word don't you just love when teachers use PowerPoint and read every word to you that was a joke no that's just a single answer in fact, in fact that's not even a multiple choice it's like the answers are no you know, there's not even a yes answer on there. Right, no and all of the above, exactly. All right. I want to briefly go through these things uh, in order, and then we will come back and talk about some of them in more detail. Um, the syllabus is, obviously, um, we know what that is, and I'll spend a few minutes going over that, not to read every word to you again, but uh, to hit the high points and to sort of uh, point out sort of the message behind the words here. Copyright information for educational projects. I post this in nearly all my classes, so you probably have seen it before. It might be good for you to refresh your memory uh, on it. And um, the idea here is that in an educational context, there are different laws that cover how you can use other people's stuff. If, for example, you ran a sporting goods store and you saw a really good picture of someone wearing Nikes, you know, LeBron James wearing Nikes, taking a jump shot, and you found it on another website and you thought, gee, that'd be great to put on my website, that's illegal. If you ran a sporting goods store and you wanted to use that picture, that would be illegal unless you got permission of the copyright holder. All right? Interestingly enough, even if you ran a not-for-profit fan site about the Cleveland Cavaliers. Strictly speaking, that would be illegal. Now, whether they would prosecute you or not, that's another issue, you know, because I know people do it, but um, as I'm sure your mom or dad said at one point in your life, just because all the other kids are doing it doesn't mean you're going to do it too, all right? Um, however, in an educational context, you're allowed a lot more leeway. And the main point is you can't take too much stuff. Um, especially like uh, audio, video clips. And the other main point is you need to give credit. So just put a citation, you know, images from clevelandbrowns.com or something like that on the bottom of your page and, and you'll be fine. But read over it to get the exact <laughs> guidelines. The assignments, um, we will have almost not quite weekly assignments. So we might have nine or ten assignments throughout a 15-week semester. So some assignments are about a week long if they're short. Other assignments might be a couple weeks long. So it ends up being about 10 uh, assignments. And there's a folder, and there will be the instructions and a Dropbox. And we'll come back towards the end of class to look at what your first assignment is. Semester project. We will talk about this in um, a, a few weeks. All right, I want to... But, but, but I would like you to read through the instructions and maybe even start thinking about it. Um, we're not ready, I'm not ready to talk about it right now, but um, in a few weeks we sh you know, I should be ready to talk about it and um, 
you know. So, so it would be good if you sort of read about it and even thought a bit about it, about it before um, we get to that point. And again, figure two or three weeks out for that. Um, you know, you look at, you know, 11.6 is the first due date for the design. And, you know, that may seem a long time from now, but believe me, it isn't. All right, time flies, and uh, that, you know, you'll be pushing up against that deadline uh, pretty soon. So at least maybe familiar yourself with the requirements of the project and start thinking about it. I have had students tell me, and this is, this is valid, all right, that it's tough to think about the project because they don't know how to do some of the things yet. For example, one of the one of the requirements of the project is that you write a query against a database where you put in like a search term and it queries a database. Well, you don't know how to do that today, right? And you won't know how to do that tomorrow or next week or whatever. But you can sort of trust that by the time the project is due, you'll know how to do that. So plan and, and assume that everything that I'm asking you to do will be covered to the degree that you know how to do it and go from there. All right. Resources. Here's where I post just things that strike my interest or that I think are beneficial um, for the class. Um, some of these are older resources. Um, in general, if I find a good website that I think will benefit the discussion or benefit um, the students of this class, I post them there. And you're certainly welcome to make suggestions uh, of things to post there. You could also post, if you find a good resource, to the discussion forum. Um, the discussion forum is sort of the equivalent of raising your hand in class and asking a question. You know, if you have something that deals specifically with something that you're working on, very specific to your project, then it's probably better to send an email. But if uh, you have a question or you found something or you had a thought that you think other people in the class would benefit from, then I would, I would suggest that you post it to the discussion forum. All right. <clears throat> Next is DreamSpark student registration informa uh, information. Um, how many of you are familiar with DreamSpark? Okay. Most all. All right. DreamSpark is a way of getting free software from Microsoft for students. And here's uh, information about it. All right, let's go and start talking about the syllabus. All right. I can kind of boil down this section into a few words. A few words will probably take me 20 minutes to say, all right, but, but still. The main point of this is there is a lot of ways to get a hold of me if you have questions about the class. What are some of those ways? I have a phone, which is probably not the best way. To be, to be honest, because I check my email a lot more frequently than I check my voicemail messages. So it's probably better to send email, but you still have that option. All right. Um, I have email, regular email, mzellers at lionccc.edu. I have email through Angel. I'm going to have office hours. I haven't decided on my office hours yet, but I will do sometime this week, and when I do, I'll post them. All right. Um, if those office hours don't work for you, you can always make an appointment. So if, if you have another class during the office hours that I define and you can't make it there, you can always make an appointment for another time. If you can't make it on campus, I don't know, I, I've had some students that, you know, they, they, they live a, a far distance away and they don't want to necessarily drive in just to get a couple questions answered. We can talk over the phone. You can arrange a, a, voice, a, a phone um, a discussion. We can do it via online chat. Or the one thing that I started last term when I was injured is to do it over Skype. Doing it over Skype is actually a very good idea uh, because I can actually see your screen. So it's not like, you know, you're describing to me, well, I'm trying to run this and, and well, that, that, 
link isn't appearing just right. Well, what do you mean by just right? Well, it's just, you know, you know, I mean, it's very hard to describe like talking on the phone. But over Skype, I can actually pull up your screen and I can see exactly what you mean. So that's an option as well. Addition to all those different methods, regular office hours, your lab time, making an appointment, you're welcome to come and sit in on any of my other classes' labs. And I'm extending the offer to the students in my other classes to come in and sit on our lab. All right. Most of the time, the labs in this class are going to be um, you working on your assignments. I'm not saying that you know we would not have some sort of special activity sometime, but for the most part, you're working on your assignments independently, and I'm there to answer questions. All right. Um, as such, you can do that just as well in a CISS 216 lab session or a CISS 265 session or whatever. So you're welcome to come in and sit on those other labs. I have uh, a day and an evening class, uh, Monday through Thursday. So um, that should give you a lot of coverage to be able to find some other time to make it in. The point of all this is, is there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me and uh, talk to me, all right? Um, however, you know, me driving to your house, knocking on the door, and asking you in person, are there any questions, do you have any problems, is not going to happen, all right? You have to meet me halfway, you know? There's a lot of things that we can do, and when I say we, I mean we as instructors can do to provide you additional assistance. And most of us want to help and want you to be successful and want you to succeed. Um, but you have to meet us halfway. Now, looking around, I, I don't think that's an issue for this class because this class, um, you know, uh, you know, it's sort of a higher level class and you've been through some of the other classes and you've been successful in those. But I sort of give this lecture um, in all my classes. Um, it's a virtue to try to figure things out by yourself to a point, all right? If you're working on something and you feel you're making progress uh, but you don't have it quite figured out and you want to try to get it on your own, that's great. But if you get to the point where you really feel that you're spinning your wheels and, and not being effective, then by all means I would ask you to, to, to ask me. Uh, what I try to do, and, and one, of the, one of the art of teaching, is to answer your question without answering it directly. Maybe give you enough information to try to allow you to answer it on your own. So that's what I try to do. And... and um, People have told me I'm getting better at that, all right? Pretty soon I probably won't answer at all and I'll just like give a look or something and, and you'll be able to figure out from that what I mean. But, but I'm not quite at that point yet. So um, I, I, think, uh, I think answers uh, are best when they lead to your discovery as opposed to me sort of spoon feeding you. And that can be frustrating sometimes because you want the answer and I, I understand that. But I think it benefits everyone um, for me not to provide the answers for specific questions, but to give you the tools to figure out these problems. Um, how do I want to put this? The problems we face in this class, you know, a specific assignment, you know, one of the assignments we do is calculate the tuition here at LC, you know. Are you ever going to be asked to calculate the tuition at a college on your job? Well, maybe if you work at, at, at a college and do software development for them. But there's a good chance that you won't. So the problem isn't to, the problem to solve isn't to calculate tuition. The problem to solve is to figure out, you know, creating classes and calling functions and this, that, and the other. That's the real problem to solve. So I hope not that you don't just get the answer to the specific question, but you learn the bigger lessons as well. I told you that this was summarized by a few words that would take me 20 minutes to say, and, and I'm, I'm proving that to be true. Pardon me? Yeah. The next section 
relates to the course and the outcomes. And read that you can read that on your own. The next section is instructor's approach. And I will be brief here. This is your class, is sort of my guiding principle. Even though this is a large ER class by my standards, it's still a small class campus wide. What, there looks like there's about a dozen people in here, give or take. That's a pretty small class. Um, the old adage is that if you don't understand something, that there's a good chance that other students don't understand it as well. So you, let me do some quick mental math here. You represent by yourself approximately 8% of the class. If you and someone else doesn't understand something, that's 16% of the class. That's a significant number. So if you have a question, ask it. You know, the worst I will do is say, hey, let's talk about this offline. Let's talk about this during lab or whatever. All right? But it's your class. It is, um, my job is to help you be successful in the class and to learn the material. All right. I do use Angel ex uh, a lot in this class. So um, on occasion, you know, if there's a question in class where I don't have a good answer, or if I make a mistake in class, believe it or not, intentional, of course. No, I'm just kidding. If I make a mistake in class and I figure out what I did wrong, I'll post like a revised example. I've, I've done do that fairly frequently. If yeah, you know how it is. You're just your mind goes blank and you just don't know, know something or whatever. So check Angel. Also check Angel for announcements. Like for example, if I needed to cancel class for whatever reason or um, you know whatever. Um, so do check Angel maybe a couple times throughout the week, even not during class. List of college policies. My policy on late week, uh, on late work rather, those of you that have had me before know that I am very flexible compared to many instructors as far as late work goes. But I do reserve the right to deduct points if it seems like you're not putting forth an effort. Well, how do I know if you're not putting forth an effort? Well, if you're working on something and I see you in lab working on it and I get emails from you asking, I don't understand how to do this, and you're meeting me halfway, then when you turn something in late, it's like, well, great. You worked hard. You got it done. It's a day late or two days late. You know, <coughs> I, I'm not really bothered by that. If, however, week 10, I start getting lab 2 and lab 3 turned in, and that does happen, believe it or not, you know, and I haven't heard from you, and I haven't talked to you, and I haven't gotten an email from you, then that, that's the kind of thing that's like, well, yeah, I think I'm going to deduct for this. That, that person um, didn't make the effort to give any sort of justification why they were running late on this. If there is some sort of personal issue that you're encountering, you believe me, you don't need to go into details about it, but just let me know, and, and I'll try to accommodate you. The thing about late assignments, though, is a one-off late assignment because a particular concept you had difficulty with or you had the flu that week and couldn't work on the computer or you had to go out of town for an emergency or whatever, if you're late one time with an assignment, that's no big deal. If, however, you're having a hard time with every assignment meeting the deadline, then that's probably a sign that we need to talk and sort of get you um, stepped up to, to uh, doing a, a bit better. Either you need to spend more time or you need to ask more questions or I need to explain it to you differently or whatever. All right, so sort of use that as a gauge. If every single assignment you have a hard time getting in on time, then um, talk to me about it. Standard grading, 90, 100, so on. I have an asterisk next to the 60 points for homework because it's approximately 60 points. Um, I, I think it benefits me to be flexible with this and to not have a rigidly defined list of assignments. 
if I see something that I think the class needs to work on, I may create an extra assignment. I might combine assignments, whatever. The point is, is when I'm done, I expect there to be around 60 points. If there's not 60 points exactly, I'll prorate it. So I'll multiply by whatever fraction to make it 60 points. All right. Then the project is a total of 40 points, and that consists of both the design and the final project. Here's a schedule of what we're doing, which is, again, approximate. We're liable to get ahead, fall behind a few times throughout the semester, but it's a good gauge for you to do reading. Are there any questions at this point? The name of this class is, <clears throat> it's a good question, what is the name of this class? Web Database Integration. Web Database Integration. Yeah. All right. ASP.net. 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 All right. Another way to term this class would be as a class about server-side scripting. So what I want to do is I want to talk about, oh, I want to first take attendance, then I want to do this. My mistake. I always forget to take attendance. If you could go around and introduce yourself if you want to start over here. I'm Matt Becht. Okay. Uh, Thomas San Lucas. Repeat that, please. Uh, Thomas San Lucas. Okay. Go ahead. John Jenkins. Okay. Next. I'm, I'm Dave Snyder. All right. Go ahead. Christian Ford. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Scott Zolhar. I'm Nicole Viva. you to leave. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Matthew Green. Matthew Green. Okay. Green Hill. And Michael Dugat. All right. Okay. We're going to start out talking about web servers and servers in general and what really happens when you type in an address in your web browser or when you click on a link or when you make a request for a web page. All right. Essentially, we're going to talk about the way that the client, that is your machine, and again, it's true whether the client is a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, a mobile device. The way your client device communicates through the Internet with a web server. In IT, what does the term server mean? When we say, you hear that thrown about all the time, like, well, we'll put it on the server, or our server is down. Well, what, what is a server? Okay, server, we heard a database, and we heard storage. It's a computer. It's a computer. Okay. Pardon me? An automated system. These are all true statements, but what makes a computer a server as opposed to just being a computer? Like, for example, is this computer a server? Well, it transmits out data. Okay, it transmits out data. All right. 
we're, all, we're, we're, we're definitely describing a server. I'm not saying that anything anyone said is incorrect, but I want to describe it on very precise terms. All right. In contrast to a server, there is a client. And a server. A server, simply put, is a system that accepts and responds to requests. All right? A system that accepts and responds to requests. A client, then, is a system that makes requests and I'm going to use a word that I like, but you know, I don't think that it eats it or anything. I'm going to say it consumes the response. So if we're going to draw a very simple diagram, of a client server, we have this. The client makes a request, the server responds to the request. Okay? What kind of request are we speaking of? Well, any kind of request. All right, any kind of request. For example, there can be an email client that makes a request to an email server to pull email. That's one example of a client server situation. All right, you could have an FTP client making requests to an FTP server to upload or download a file. And that's one kind of client-server interaction. You can have a database client talking to a database and the database sending back data. That's another example. Or you could have a web server, whereas a client is making requests to a web server and the web server provides a response. Now in the case of a web environment, that client is going to be some device running a browser. All right, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, uh, Firefox, whatever. The web server is going to be running certain web server software, all right, and is going to be delivering back to the client web pages. All right, that's the client server model for that. The client makes a request through their web browser using a particular protocol. A protocol is a way of communicating between two entities. All right? In the case of web pages, one of the protocols is HTTP. And the request from the client will also include the URL that they want. So in other words, if you were to open up your web browser, and your client page wanted to request Elsie's web page, you would go into the address bar and type in http colon slash slash lorraineccc.edu. That's your request. Now there's more about your request in addition to that, but the fact that what this is saying is, hey, Use the HTTP protocol, and here is the web page that I want, the home page for LorraineCCC.edu. What do you get back? You get back a web page. All right? The important thing to consider is that any machine may be both a client and a server depending on the context. All right? And we'll talk about, hold that thought, we'll come back and talk about that later on. So, when we talk about a machine being the server, we're talking about a specific context that is the server in. A machine isn't always a server, and some inter 
interactions, it might be the client. It's just like a server in a restaurant could, on their day off, go to another restaurant, in which case they're not the server then, they're the client, and the other white person is the, the server. Now, I have this drawn as a direct line, as a general case, the client making a request, the server sending back a response. But in web interactions, which are one of the main things that we're going to be talking about, that request goes through the internet. And I must say, long before I heard people droning on about cloud computing, I drew this diagram with a cloud. So I'm not claiming credit for it. I'm just saying I was an early adopter of sort of that terminology. Visionary. A visionary, yes. Now, what does it mean to, put, to, to depict the internet as a cloud? Why do we show it as a cloud? It's everywhere. That's one reason. But it's also like it's separate from your client and your server. It's it's separate from your client and server. And there's a much more biting reason. So John's is a cloud because we don't care what happens inside of there. We trust that we're connected to the internet, and if we make a request, somehow it will make it to the proper server. How it makes it there, we don't care. So we know that when we do this, it's popping around all these different machines, and then finally it makes it to the server. All right? We know that, or we may not know that, but we in this class don't care. So when you see me represent the internet as a cloud, What that really means is zellers don't care. Ask Huffman. <laughs> All right. For the purposes of this class, we can sort of forget about that, and we can just trust that it happens. All right. We are interested about though what happens on both the other ends, and as I mentioned before, client makes a request. That request gets sent to the server, and the server prepares a response and sends the response back to the client. And what is that response? That response is a web page. And related other files. So an HTML document, some JavaScript, some CSS, images, etc. So when I say a web page, that's what I mean. I mean all that stuff. I'll just sort of shorthand call it a web page. Is put in terms that the browser understands. What does the browser understand? The browser understands HTML, and the browser understands JavaScript, and the browser understands CSS, and the browser understands how to display images. What does a request consist of? It consists of a protocol, which could be HTTP or it could be HTTPS for a secure connection. And it consists of a URL. So that's what the client provides. This is what the client gets back. Now about the server. All right. In the simplest scenario, like for example, the pages that maybe you created in CISS um, 216,
The server has a very easy job if it's dealing with static web pages. What does the word static mean? Doesn't move, doesn't change, stays the same. Stays the same unless someone manually intervenes. Okay? What does that mean from our perspective? What it means from our perspective is that no matter who requests the page, this package looks the same. It gets back the same HTML, gets back the same CSS, gets back the same JavaScript, the same images. That's what we mean by a static page. And the server's job is easy in this environment. The server is simply pulling the pages, the files out of the bin and just sending them back to whoever asked for them. It's like the server at a McDonald's, right? You ask the server at McDonald's for a Big Mac and fries, the server turns around, finds a Big Mac bin, pulls it out, turns around, finds the fries, pulls it out, and hands it to you. The server doesn't do really anything that complicated. Those things were made in advance. They're sitting out there waiting to be delivered. And the only thing the server does is deliver those to you, the client. Even messes up your order on occasion. <laughs> Even messes up your order on occasion. Server error. Yeah, server error, right. The server <laughs> crashed. That's static pages. Now, what's the problem with static pages? Well, what's the problem with, well, there's a lot of problems with, I'd say what's the problem with ordering a Big Mac, but what's the problem with having things out there waiting to be delivered? The problem is everyone gets the exact same thing, all right? Um, so, if I wanted a hamburger and I'm allergic to pickles, all right, or if I wanted no onions, or extra ketchup, or whatever, this model doesn't work very well for that. All right? In fact, you know, that was a big part of Burger King's marketing, if you remember. They noticed that McDonald's was just cranking out these burgers, and they came out with uh, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, and I'm probably dating myself, but go on YouTube and search out those commercials from the... 70s maybe, I don't know. Um, but the point is, is that there's no customization. It delivers the same page every time. All right? So let's think about the implication of that. If it's going to deliver the same page every time, how do you do a search? How do you let the user type something in and pull results specifically for what they typed in? Can't do it. All right? How would Google work? It doesn't even make sense. Could they have a page for every possible thing that you could possibly search for? Uh, of course not. It doesn't make sense. For one thing, even if they did do that, even if they anticipated every single thing that you could type into their search engine, how would it know, how would the server know which page to pull up? It wouldn't. Right. How would Amazon work in an environment like this? Would there be a separate page for every product? Well, there would have to be, right? Well, then how would you place an order and put in your credit card information and make sure that your credit card is charged when this is delivering the same sort of package to every single person, all right? It wouldn't work. So the point is, is we need a more customized approach. We need to make, sa uh, make sandwiches, right. We need to make web pages the way that Subway makes sandwiches. How do you go in and order a sandwich at Subway? You go in and say, I want a turkey club. Okay, uh, what kind of bread do you want? Well, I want wheat. Um, do you want any cheese on it? Yeah, give me provolone. Um, what else would you like on it? I'll have... Um, 
So I'm actually thinking my actual order, like I'm going to go and get this at the end, you know. Are you but, product placing here? Yeah, right, right. You'll, you'll know that I'll come in one of these days and I'll have like Subway on the, on the arm or something. And it's like, wow, this sparkling Deer Park water is refreshing. <laughs> Anyone out there on YouTube, you know, give me a call. The point is, is my request at McDonald's is simply to give like a URL, like Big Mac, all right? I request that and that's what I get. My request at Subway is a little bit different. I ask for a turkey club, but I provide some additional information, all right? And that information can be a lot of different things. Yes? Is this the internet tools? Uh, no, this isn't. She, she looked at me like she thought I was lying. It's like, <laughs> I like having students in my class. I was thinking of lying and saying yes just to get a, another student. But yeah. um, At any rate, you supply more information as part of your request. And you get back something custom for you. So let's look how the server's role is going to change a little bit. All right. Let's look at Google. Not only do I have a URL that I'm calling, I have my search term. Let's say I'm doing a search on ASP.net. Think of that as like saying I want wheat bread, right? Or whatever. Now if I do a Google advanced search, I can supply more parameters even. I can say I only want pages in English. I can say I only want pages that were updated in the past 90 days. I can say exclude these sorts of pages and so on. All right. So I can supply a lot of parameters here as part of the request in addition to my one search term. And again, that's the equivalent in Subway of saying all the different things that you want or don't want on your sandwich. The server then, again, we've already said that it's not possible for the server to have a whole bunch of static pages sitting out there waiting for them to be requested. So what does the server have instead? The server has what are called scripts. Another way, so you know, server-side scripts. And uh, another way of, of saying this is a dynamic page. Or in continuing the food analogy, it doesn't have finished sandwiches. It has the recipe for making a sandwich. All right. The request then comes through the internet, just like with a static page, but it contains some other information. I want a page about ASP.net. I want to make sure it's in English. I want to make sure it's been updated within the past 90 days. The server then's job becomes more difficult. All right? The server then doesn't have a completed web page sitting there waiting for me because it has no idea what parameters or what combination of parameters I want. Instead, it has a recipe to make my page for me. All right? It has a script. It has a little program that takes my information and does something with it, does some sort of processing. Now, more than likely, that processing is going to involve interacting with the database. All right. So Google has software that crawls the internet looking for indexing the internet effectively. 
it creates and builds some giant database of all the web pages that are out there. You do a search. This recipe makes some queries to the database and gets back the results. The server then formats those results into a form that the client can understand. And what is that form again? What do clients understand? Web pages, which are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The point is, is that no matter if we're talking about static pages, which simply get delivered as is, without any sort of additional processing, or whether we're talking about dynamic pages, the thing that gets delivered to the client is the same thing. A web page. HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and the image files, and so on. That package gets delivered. The difference is, is in the case of static pages, those pages are pre-made, sitting out there waiting. The server simply grabs them and sends them. In the case of dynamic pages, the server generates the page. Server-side scripts effectively are programs whose output is our web pages. So you're not necessarily going to write a web page. You're going to write a program that writes a web page. Well, why do we learn HTML? Well, you have to know how to write HTML to write a program to write HTML. All right? So that's where, that's the difference between these dynamic pages and the static pages. So what do these server-side scripts look like? They can be any number of different languages. All right? They can be done in ASP.NET and C Sharp, or ASP.NET and VB. Or they can be done in PHP, or Python, or Perl, or Ruby, or any number of different uh, programming, server-side programming languages. But regardless of the specific server-side programming language, the job is the same. All right? the, 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 the code takes and writes a web page and produces it. So all these have in common, and all these serve the same purpose. So PHP and ASP.NET do the same thing. They serve the same purpose. They provide uh, dynamic web pages uh, by generating web pages on the fly. All right? Now, the nice thing about this is, is that updating a site like this is easy. All right? <coughs> if I have a page that has, you know, let's think of an Amazon where you can search for a product, you can get a list of products, you can uh, get recommendations for products, you can um, order a product. Once these scripts are set up, if I want to introduce a new product, all I have to do is update this database with the product information. And instantly, that product is available for purchase and search and, and so on down the line. I don't have to go out and create any new web pages. All right, because this code is flexible enough to whatever is put out in the database, it can handle and it can process it. Um, news sites, you know, a new new news story comes in. You don't have to create a web page specifically for it. They can add the information to a database, and that news item will appear on their site. Any questions so far? Now, rewinding a little bit. All right. I said that any machine could be both a client and a server, depending on the situation. Oftentimes, if I'm going to complete this model, the web server doesn't necessarily interact directly with the database. The web server goes through a database server. And the database server is what communicates with the database. This would be especially true in, in a larger uh, sort of application. All right. In smaller applications, the web and the database server might be the same machine, just wearing two different hats. But in other cases, the database server is a separate machine. 
Another thing that all these languages have in common is that they are a mix of plain old HTML and code in whatever programming language is being used. So for example, if I go, if I think about Amazon, not every single piece of a page in Amazon is dynamically generated. In other words, there's a certain number of links that are on a page that it doesn't matter who is ordering. All right? Those can be represented and those can be put in just plain old HTML. Those don't require server-side coding. The part of it that would require server-side coding would be the part that is different from page to page. So the product image and the product price and those sorts of things would be different. Now, what are some ways that we can make a page dynamic? One way that we talked about so far is pages can be dynamic based on user input. In other words, if I put in different items in the search page, I'll get back different results. What are other ways that a page could be dynamic? You could get the user's location and make a page. Get the user by location and do that. In fact, if we talk about Google, all right, Google uses a variety of factors in determining how to come up with your search results. All right? So, for example, if I typed in, and you can try this uh, in lab, I, I won't fire up the projector at this point, but um, if I typed in Italian restaurants, it's going to show me Italian restaurants in the Cleveland area, or in the Illyria, Cleveland area. All right? Does that mean that Illyria and Cleveland have the best Italian restaurants in the world? I don't know. Probably not. Probably the web server is smart enough to know that that request came from a certain IP address, and that IP is located in Illyria, let's say, and therefore it gives me results in the Illyria area. All, these, all the things that are going to be dynamic about a page are going to come, or, or I won't say all, but many of the things that come are going to come as part of this little request package. So if this is the response here, this is the request. And part of the request, in addition to the protocol, the URL, any user input, part of it is going to be the IP address, which can be used to determine location. That's not always foolproof, by the way. Um, I had a problem for a while where the Google web server thought I was in Germany. I wasn't in Germany. I had no plans of going to Germany. All right? But if I typed in google.com, it sent me automatically to google.de. All right? For some reason, there was a glitch in the, uh, you know, the, 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 the server messed up my order. All right? It looked at my IP address and some table that contains what IP address maps to what physical location was wrong and it sent me to the wrong place. But I haven't experienced problems like that lately. All right? Most of the time I, I get pretty reasonable. I, I've gotten, I haven't noticed any problems with this. Where's, go ahead. I had a lady at work not too long ago. Uh, she thought that the government was watching in on her because every time she would Google something, it would be in her local area. Tell her it's worse than the government watching her. It is Google watching her. <laughs> other, uh, other things that a page could be dynamic on. How about like based on like the user agent, like based on what kind of device is, is looking at it? Uh, based on the kind of device. Yeah, right. No I, I printed this bunch of choices. Let's just recap HTML here. Uh, no, I took mobile, but we did all this. Yeah. It, uh, no fair, you were paying attention. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Device or user agent is probably uh, those two things sort of go hand in hand. In other words, it's interesting, you know, not interesting, but um, I've noticed, you know, if I'm on my Mac and I go to um, a site, the ads are Mac related. 
the download link that is more prominent is Mac related, and so on down the line. If I go to a mobile device, it will send me to a mobile version of the page in some cases. All right, so that's another way a page can be dynamic. And again, what do I mean by dynamic? I mean the user's getting, for my purposes, it means the user gets a different package, all right, than other people do. Static means every user gets the same package, yes. So you have a handicap, colorblind or blind in general, or deaf, kind of, would that be considered part of it? By the way, it has like voiceover text and stuff like that. The key here, I know what you mean, the key here would be, would the server know about that and deliver different HTML in that case? They have specific settings for their browser, as in voiceover, because they're blind or something like that. Because we turn that stuff on all the time. For blind people. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, because it does send back and say, hey, this person's blind, so I'm going to turn on voiceover. I just remember because your HTML, one okay. of our projects, we had to do that. So. Right. All right, that, that would be an example. Yeah, so the, Pardon me? Accessibility. Accessibility. Yeah, there you go. Accessibility. Options, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, I definitely could see that being um, a, a factor. Could be dynamic based on how big your screen is. Look how big your monitor is. All right. All, it, it can really be dynamic on anything that comes as part of the request. All right. And that can be a lot of things. Some other things that it could be, be dynamic uh, based on would be based on who the user is, the user ID. Could anyone think of a case of a web page that's different depending on the user ID? ESPN.com. ESPN.com. How, so how is that different? Because uh, you log in your username and it'll give you all your teams that you okay. follow. Okay, right. So when you create an account there, you specify which teams you're interested in, and uh, it, it shows you a page specific to that. Yes? Would, that, would you guys consider Angel? Absolutely. Because you see it differently than we do. Absolutely. I would see it differently two ways than you would. All right? I would see it differently, first of all, because I have a different schedule than you do. So you might be taking this class in accounting and speech and phys ed. You know, I'm teaching a list of CISS classes. All right? So it knows who we are when we log on. All right? And it shows me the classes that are appropriate to me, and it shows you the classes that are appropriate to you. Now, the interesting thing is, is after you log on, it remembers who you are. All right? You don't have to log on every time, so you don't have to like enter in the form every time, hey, I'm M. Zellers, and so on. We'll talk later on in the system how you can remember stuff from request to request, but that's absolutely a case. What do you suppose the second way that my page looks different than your page? Let's say for this class. Yeah, I have different options. In other words, I can grade stuff, I can post new stuff, I can do different things, so I have different permissions. So based on who I am and the role I perform in the class. The interesting thing is, is based on the role that I perform in the class. So if I was taking a history class, just because I'm faculty doesn't mean I can go and grade my own stuff. All right, I would be in that role, I would be as a student, and therefore I'd only have student permissions for that. All right. Any other? Would this include cookies, or is that different? Well, cookies is a mechanism by which you can remember this stuff. So we're, we're really interested just in the case, we're, we're interested now in the case of, for any given one request, how that page can be dynamic. Cookies gets into how can it remember that information to use it again later, so I don't have to put my user ID in every time. So it's related, but that will kind of come a little bit later in the term. Could it be a, what, what country they're in? What country you're in? I guess that's an aspect of location, but absolutely what, what, what country uh, you're in. Date and time. Date and time. All right. Um, in other words, you know, think of, let's say, NBC.com. You know, do they have a web developer frantically looking, ooh, it's 8 p.m. now, better go update our schedule. No, they have all that stuff in advance, and then when 8 o'clock rolls around, it shows you what's on at 8 o'clock, all right? Uh, or or if then, like, when today's Tuesday on Wednesday at 8 o'clock, it'll show me what's on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. So based on date and time, 
I started thinking of a good assignment for the 232 class, if any of you are in it. What if we made a page where it got brighter during daytime and darker at nighttime? That'd be a fun one. I have an app that does that. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it is, it's pretty cool. Um, I, my, uh, my phone actually takes it a step further, and you could probably do this, but that would be probably more of a mobile app. Uh, or a mobile uh, website one, whereas it, my, my screen will look different, not just depending on the time of the day, but depending on the weather. So if it's sunny, it will, I'll get like a little lens flare going on. If it's cloudy, I'll have clouds. If it's rainy, I'll have little drops appearing on my screen, uh, and so on. So There might be others, but I think you get the idea. The point is, all these things allow you to take sort of the static web pages and really turn it into these things being and forming a more robust web application. All right, that isn't just spitting out images. When the web was first created, those static pages were great. All right, they, they were done. Uh, and, and they provided, you know, some great functionality and got some great information out. However, that was found to be inadequate, you know, or people, I won't say inadequate, but people said, well, that's great, but can we do this now? Can we make it so that different people get to see different things, or we can search through our website or whatever? And that's where dynamic pages uh, came into play. Um, those old static pages at one point started being called brochureware, right? Because essentially they were just a brochure that was online, which was great, especially in 1990, whatever. But now, pretty much any site that uh, does anything of significance is going to be a dynamic site. But the only site that I could kind of see being a static site, the, the most obvious example I can think of, would be something like a site for a restaurant, where it doesn't really change that much. You know, the menu is pretty well set. Um, you know, um, even that, if you have things like daily specials or whatever. You get, can order in most restaurants that I can order. Too. Well, if you can order online, right, if it's takeout, right, then, then it couldn't be. So the point is, is I used to have an assignment to find some static pages. That actually got to be too hard, you know, too hard to do. And in fact, even sites that are to a large degree static, like most of Lorain Community College's site is static, but <coughs> there's search capabilities and all that. It'd be hard pressed to find any site that doesn't have some element of dynamic in it. Questions at this point? How many, of you, how many of you are familiar with Visual Studio? Okay, most, all right. Let's t spend a minute talking about your first assignment. Because your first assignment, I would like you to use Visual Studio for. Right. I, told, I told you, yeah, I told you, yeah, Well, it kind of makes sense. If I spent a lot of time in homework, it wouldn't be that homework, would it? It would be classwork. So, yeah, that doesn't bother me a bit. I warned you. It, it, it amazes me the things that students say, not as complaints, but that I'm like thinking like, yeah, that's exactly how I intended it. Yeah, I'm doing well. Yay. Hooray for my team, you know. All right, create a web page, an overview of the course's main topics. The main topics are ASP.NET, database design, and SQL. I'm not going to read it to you, all right, other than to explain a little bit about references and resources and what I mean by that. Because people seem to be confused about that, and I would say don't. Don't agonize over, over it. A reference I would define as something that explains to you what it is. A resource would be something 
that you would use if you were working in that particular technology. So, for example, a Wikipedia entry about SQL might be a reference, right? Because it would tell you what SQL is. If you had no idea what SQL was, you could go to Wikipedia and look at it, and that would be a reference about it. But my guess is, is that the, the Wikipedia entry for SQL would do you no good if you had to write some SQL statements. All right? It wouldn't be a resource that you could go and use, like, I was stuck on, I forgot how to write a select statement. All right? <coughs> That's what I mean by a resource versus a reference. Reference explains what a technology is. A resource helps you to use it. And again, don't worry about splitting hairs. Take a shot. You'll be fine. All right. I'll let you read the rest of it. I do want to show you basically the steps that you'll need to do to complete this. I have not been in front of a class um, until yesterday for five and a half months. So, therefore, I'm making up for lost time. So, you're getting more than your money's worth in this class because you're already getting a, a minute extra. Um, I'm going to check to see if, if you'll actually be billed for this, but you probably won't. We did an iPhone over the Skype. Cool. Yeah. That, that is probably the highlight. For those of you that don't know, I broke my hip in the middle of spring semester last year, and... I conducted one class for my hospital bed via Skype. That, yeah, that was, that was like a, a uh, I, I think I deserve like a Lifetime Achievement Award for that one. And he had me send, take a picture of himself on the screen. Yeah, the I did. So just just to prove, him. right. Yeah. Can we find that on YouTube? <laughs> I don't think the lecture was recorded, but I, I'll look for the picture. I'm sure I have it somewhere. I'm sure I deleted my copy, sorry. <laughs> oh, use your wallpaper on your phone, come on. <laughs> All right, I'm going into Visual Studio, and we'll talk about what you need to do to create this. Now, I know some of you have done C Sharp, you might do things a little bit different, but it's good that in general you have that background, but we're going to talk about how we're going to do it to make it most simple, easiest for this class. You open Visual Studio, you go up and say, so like the first time, you will go up and you will say that you want to create a new website. Not a new product or a new, or a project rather, or a new solution, but you'll say you create a new website. So file, new, website. It will then ask you some questions. And to start out, select the first option, an empty website. Pick Visual C Sharp, although for the first assignment that's not very critical because we're not writing any code. But for future assignments, pick Visual C Sharp. You can then specify where you want to put this by clicking Browse. And just putting in the directory. Click OK. When you do that, it's going to create the, the what it calls a project or the website, all right, called Lab One. You'll find that as a folder. <coughs> in whatever directory I created it. All right. So I created it on the desktop. These two files are unrelated, by the way. That lab one folder, and you'll notice it contains two things, a web config file and a web debug config file. I'd encourage all of you to show 
the file name extensions, web config and web debug config. All right, so you have this folder. You can then go in and say to create a new file and you will select that you want to create a, you could select H, uh, HTML page if you wished, or you could pick a web form. I would suggest that you pick web form. Is there a difference? Yes. Yeah, uh, 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 web form is, is a truly a dynamic ASP.NET. Uh, even, even though we're not going to do anything with it dynamic, it has the potential to be turned into something dynamic. Notice the name is default.aspx. The default name is default.aspx. Um, <coughs> you should keep that because that is sort of like a default homepage name. So your first page in any new website should be default.aspx. You should also place code in separate file. All right. Um, if I remember your textbook, which I may have the wrong version on the syllabus now that I think about it, but your textbook says the first one, like, don't check this. Always check this. All right. Then you click Add. When you do that, then you get an HTML editor that you can go in and edit. And you can go in and edit, and you can put in your HTML, and it will have the IntelliSense and all those nice things, and you can create any HTML that you want. All right? Now, many of you, I'm sure, had, how many of you have had the CIS 216 class? So the HTML. Yeah, the HTML class. All right, so good part of you have had the HTML. Don't forget all the stuff that you learned in that class. Okay? So... Go through and create a page that looks good, looks professional. And for this assignment, you're probably best off just coding it by hand and putting in the CSS and, and so on. Um, there is a design mode, which is a more visual mode, which you can do the whole drag and drop thing. The one thing to remember, though, is that when you start with the drag drop things, it doesn't always do things exactly the way you want it to. You don't really, you lose a bit of control with that. And for doing straight HTML, I would just suggest um, doing the, using the source view to, uh, to do that. And then you'll create the web page as described in the, in the assignment. If you have questions about this, we can review it in lab. Are there any questions now? All right, we'll see you over in lab. What I typically will do is probably go and unlock the lab for you, then come back and pull the files off of here so that I can upload uh, the videos. Does anyone know of a program, free program that is, that allows you to merge MP4 files? All right, I, I, think, I think I have one somewhere I'll have to look. Because... This machine records uh, the videos in chunks, and uh, th so therefore there might be like three or four um, parts to this video. It'd be nice if I could just upload one. All right, see you over, Lamb.